Welcome. Uh, my name is Jason Steinhauer. I'm the director of the LePage Center uh, for History and the Public Interest here at Villanova. And on behalf of uh, my colleagues in the College of Arts and Sciences, in the History Department, the faculty director, Paul Steggy, and the dean of the college, Adele Lindemeyer, I want to thank you for joining us this evening, spending your lovely Tuesday evening with us. A couple administrative announcements before we turn it over to Chris Sotillo for the event. Um, I will take this opportunity to remind you to put your cell phones on silent or on vibrate so that they don't interrupt the proceedings. Don't turn them off, however, because we are live tweeting uh, at the hashtag LePage at VU, and we'll put the hashtag up on the screen in a minute. Um, so we will be sharing highlights from the conversation on Twitter, and we encourage you to jump in, both in person and on social media, if you have thoughts or comments or things you want to add to the conversation. Um, this event is the final event in a, a really a four-part series that we've done this academic year on democracy. So there's been a lot of rhetoric in the public square about democracy, whether democracy is in danger here in the United States and around the world, the state of democratic politics. And so we felt this was an opportunity for the LePage Center to bring some historical perspective to these conversations and think about democracy not necessarily solely about today, but over a long duration, a long durée. Our event, our first event in the fall, looked at democracy, uh, histories of democracy in an American perspective, right? Uh, we had Joanne Freeman here, a historian from Yale, who talked about how the founding generation actually viewed democracy with great skepticism. Uh, they envisioned uh, a democracy or a form of government that did not include everyone, that only included a select few who would make decisions on behalf of the whole. And how that vision of American politics, that vision of American government has evolved over time. Who's been included, who's been excluded, and sort of where we are today in terms of democratic participation in the United States. We then had an event about democracy and global perspectives. Right? Democracy means different things in different places. It means one thing in the United States, it means other things in the Soviet Union and former Soviet republics, it means yet another thing in the Middle East. And so that conversation really examined democracy in all its different meanings in different locations. So from there, we decided to ask the question, OK, well, we've talked about democracy sort of broadly. How do we actually participate in democracy? And so that was the question that has inspired these two events in the spring. And our first event a couple weeks ago uh, examined activism and its role in democracy, both today and historically. And uh, Paul Steggy and I, Dr. Steggy and I, were actually, in formulating these events, we, we asked ourselves a question, what's the opposite of activism? All right, so activism is one way that people make their voice heard in democratic politics, but not everybody is an activist. In fact, most people are not. What's the other side of that coin? And we kind of came up with the idea of, well, everyday life. Right? The way that we support local organizations, uh, paying our taxes, supporting a local library, attending a PTA meeting, uh, the clothes that we buy, the fashion that we wear, the Starbucks that we drink. These are all ways that we participate in democracy. And is that line between activism and democracy as rigid as we think, or is it somewhat blurred? And what can looking at these questions with a historical perspective tell us about our democracy today and how we arrived at this point. So those were some of the impetuses for this conversation. And I think you're going to be enlightened and perhaps surprised by what you hear during this conversation. Now, tonight's event is structured as an unpanel. So it really is going to be a conversation, or in fact, a series of conversations. We are very fortunate to have uh, Chris Satillo, formerly of WHYY and the Inquirer, here to lead us through this unpanel format. And I'll turn it over to him in just a minute. But you all, by being in the audience tonight, you are going to be actively part of the event. You are going to be breaking out into groups to discuss things that you hear, and then reporting back to the panelists to share your insights, your thoughts, and ask further questions. So really, by being in the audience tonight, you are also a participant in the event. So congratulations. <laughs> I hope you're pleased with what you signed up for. It's a little bit of an experimental format. And after this event, we are going to send a survey to get your feedback about this format to see if this is something we should continue doing at our LePage Center events in the future. 
I am not going to introduce the three speakers, uh, or four speakers, I should say, on the stage because their bios are here up on the screen for you. Um, and uh, it's part of our small part of uh, saving the planet and, and being environmentally conscious at the LePage Center. We do not print out programs and uh, one-page sheets with bios that then invariably wind up in the recycle bin. So the bios of our panelists are up on the screen. I'll leave them up here for a few minutes. And of course, many of you have your laptops and smartphones with you. You can look up our speakers online, Google them, see more about them, see some of their publications and other speaking engagements that they've done. The last thing I'll just say is that uh, since you are all actively part of the event, uh, we just encourage you to keep the conversation civil and constructive. Uh, you may hear things uh, from the stage and in your working groups uh, that surprise you, that perhaps you disagree with, uh, but we encourage you to be open to new perspectives, to different ideas, to thinking about these questions in new ways, and I think that'll make it an enriching event for all of us. So I think that's all of the administrative announcements that I need to make. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Chris Sotillo to get the evening started. Hey, Jason, thanks very much. And great to see you all here tonight. Uh, as Jason said, we're trying to make this event as interactive as possible. So I'm going to start out with a poll. Uh, how many of you were here for the previous Unpanel event? OK, so I'm going to rely on some of you to advise, uh, reassure, and console the people at seats nearby that they will survive the unpanel format, which I'll describe in a minute. To pick up on one more thing Jason said, uh, I do a lot of work around civic engagement and dialogue. And in that work, you develop some ground rules, which are sort of guardrails for civic conversation. And one of the key ones is if you hear something that you disagree with, or even that upsets you, uh, do two things, if you would. One, before you open your mouth and say anything, take a pause. Let that first rush of emotion wash away. And think about what you want to say. And then consider, at least consider, instead of responding with a statement or a dismissal of what somebody said, try to come up with a question that you can ask, person, ask the person so you can better understand how it is they came to a position that's so different from your own. And when I say ask a question, I don't mean a question that's like, how could you be so ignorant as to think that? <laughs> but uh, help me understand a little bit how you came to that conclusion or whatever. So that's just one, one guideline. If you know some disagreements arise tonight, as they might, and as in some ways we hope they will. <coughs> now for the format. Um, we're going to start out with our august uh, experts and scholars up here giving you a little bit of food for thought uh, about the topic, the interaction between everyday life and democracy. How does democracy and politics act upon everyday life, maybe intrude into it? And then how in response does everyday life react and act upon politics? How does that sort of cycle um, happen? Uh, it was interesting. Um, we asked for people who signed up to make some statements. And one of the interesting things were the number of statements, some of them were appearing on the uh, screen before we got going, that sort of said, right now, I'm looking at everyday life as a refuge or a haven from democracy, um, which I'm not sure we would have heard a few years ago. But we'll sort of get into that a little bit. Um, each one of the uh, scholars is going to speak for a short period of time to give you some food for thought to get things going. Then what we're going to do is throw the conversation out to you. So what we're going to ask you to do is to gather. It might involve moving around a little bit, although you're nicely sprinkled around the room. We're going to have to have you guys maybe move around a little bit. But try to find a group of four to five people. Turn around, look who's behind you. But then just talk about what thoughts were sort of running through your head, what other issues cropped up, or what responses and or questions you had to what you heard up here. Uh, our panelists will be wandering around, listening in, and if, if invited or asked, can join the conversations, add a little bit more from their scholarship and expertise. But we'll have that go for however long the energy stays in the room. Last time it was, what, Paul, about 25 minutes that it went on with pretty good energy. Um, then we're going to bring um, the panelists back up. My first question will um, be to them. What did you hear? What did you notice about the conversations? Then we'll open it up to comments and questions and observations from you at the audience that you can sort of share uh, what happened in your own brain or in the uh, conversations that we had in that 20 to 25 minute period. Um, the extroverts are in 
are encouraged to raise their hands and just make a comment or, or observation, but we'll also have an opportunity, if you're introverted and don't feel like doing that, you can write your observation or your question down uh, on a note and hand it up to me, and I'll try to share it with the group. So does everybody sort of follow what we're going to do? About 10, 15 minutes of opening reflections, 20 to 25 minutes of conversation among you in small groups, and then we'll come back on the stage and try to pull it all together in a rolling conversation. Uh, with that, let's get started. And Tiffany, I'm going to ask you to start, if you would. Okay. So when I thought about the topic of today's conversation about democracy and I have a little too much heat on here. About democracy. Is that, oh, there we go. About democracy and, <laughs> there you go. Um, about democracy in everyday life. I began thinking about the historical actors that have best um, explained what democracy is, have best engaged what democracy is, particularly in this country, and have been the ones who really have laid out the tenets of democracy and have been the ones to actually force this nation into living up to its ideals of bringing the everyday experience into democracy. Um, and the people that I think about are not the founders, um, are not the ones who gathered um, to sign the Declaration of Independence, were not the ones to even pen the Constitution which lays out the parameters of our democracy. Um, I think about those for whom um, American democracy has, has always been um, more of an ideal and something that has eluded their everyday lives. And I think particularly about the formerly enslaved. And actually today is the 100th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. And I really think about this moment um, at the end of the Civil War when those who had been so marginalized from the experience of American democracy um, really are the ones who call the nation to actually define what democracy is, define its parameters, and use their experiences to push it forward. So I think about the formerly enslaved and I think about their descendants. And, and, and why I think they're particularly important to a conversation about um, democracy in everyday life is that they saw most clearly the spaces in everyday life where their lack of democratic power um, had the greatest impact, right? That democracy, even as we use the term, is often talked about theoretically often or as in idealized things. But for those who um, could see clearly as to what was to be attained through democratic power but were on the outside of it, they're the ones, I think, who can best define it. And I always say, um, at any moment in time and culture, you don't look to the people in power to help us think about what democracy is. You look, about, look at those who are marginalized from it. So I think about the formerly enslaved. I think about how the first things they did had to do with their everyday lives. So for them, freedom, um, sort of the attendant to democracy, some of the first things they did were trying to find family members and protect them, right? Very sort of everyday bread and butter kinds of things. They looked for work and looked for protections around work. Yes, they advocated for voting rights um, and fought for them and were among the group putting the pressure on um, Congress to expand voting rights through the 15th Amendment. Um, but it was always bigger than that. It was about food. It was about the self-expression. It was about being able to control one's image. It was about being able to control spaces and to protect oneself. Very day-to-day -day things because that was a space where they most clearly saw their lack of democratic power. And when we think about, I think, African Americans coming out of slavery and their descendants, and think not just about how they were calling for 
the, the ideals of democracy to impact their everyday lives, I also think about the ways in which they engage in activism which come out of those spaces of everyday life. So if we think about the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, so much of the activity were in things like sit-ins, in um, restaurants, at beaches, in libraries, very day-to-day -day spaces where they were kept out of because of their race, but were calling those spaces and making them politicized. And I also think about reluctant activists of the civil rights movement who were kept out of formal democratic spaces and instead created places of activism out of their everyday life. So my research, and we can talk more about it later, is about, uh, one of my first book was about African American beauticians and looking at how this unlikely group of black women who were kept out of formal political spaces, were even kept out of the spaces within black communities like black churches in terms of leadership, turned to the space of every day where they gathered and made beauty shops, not just into places where one gets their hair done, but actually created them into um, political institutions where voting registrations were happening, where um, women were learning how to read and write so that they could take citizenship education classes, where they built health institutions to meet black women's needs. So again, so sort of thinking about every day, thinking about how for those most marginalized, democracy can never be about ideals. It has to meet the everyday. But also looking at those who are marginalized, how they're kept out of traditional democratic institutions and instead use the spaces of everyday life to actually foment their revolutions for more democracy. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I think, Paul, since this is a home game for you, we'll have you have your at-bat last. <laughs> so that means we go to Bryant next. Oh, thanks. thanks for being here. Um, I love this idea of everyday practices of democracy, and I, I want to sort of underline this idea of everyday practices of democracy, because, and I, and I think Tiffany, you know, began to hint at this, we, we often think about democracy in founding documents, in elections, in debates on television, but again, we both wittingly and unwittingly participate and nurture democracy every day. And so I want to look at two kind of arenas of democracy, both in terms of their potential and ones that are often closed off, and use those uh, to sort of open up the conversation. And the, those two are public spaces and buying. I want to sort of look at those two things. And um, democratic theorists talk about public space all the time. They talk about the importance of public space all the time for democracy. And what do they mean by that? What do they mean by public space? They mean parks. They mean town squares. They mean libraries. And they might mean coffee shops. They mean places where different people gather <clears throat> and where people confront and can engage with people they don't normally meet in their everyday lives. And the idea is that that expands your network and that democracy depends on seeing ourselves and others, depends on empathy, depends on us knowing others, and that if we want to build democracy, we have to build those everyday spaces. And you can even think about this here on campus, right? The kinds of spaces that Villanova's built or hasn't built that allow you to engage with people you don't confront in your normal everyday life, in your normal social circles, and the way that can help you have a better sense of this place. The other kinds of places to think about when it comes to building democracy are the most protean and ordinary we can imagine. Public bathrooms, for instance, rec centers, the kinds of swimming pools, the kinds of places that say back to us that we matter in our democracy, that our day-to-day -day lives matter enough that things will be built that we can use in day-to-day -day life. And so those are, that's one area, I think, of everyday democratic practices, both that we need to pay attention to and that maybe, you know, if we can sort of think about that, some people would argue have withered in recent life, withered as a result of suburbia, withered as a, as a result of our unwillingness to be in places with people who don't look and act like us, 
and that one of the challenges is to rebuild those. So now I want to move to kind of a second alternative place that I think maybe democracy takes place, and that is through buying at the point of purchase. And the way in which we think about, well, what, will, what, will, what we buy, will it matter? Can we make a difference? Can we say something about who we are and what we care about through what we buy? And I think many people engage in this, right? We, we might buy something that will protect the rainforest. We might buy something that will say that it has an environmental identification to it. We may buy something because we believe in the message of that company. Or we may buy, there's movements, for instance, restaurants who now are paying their workers a living wage and taking care of health care and using that as an advertisement and asking you to patronize that restaurant and maybe pay, in some cases, $3 more for a meal. Politics through buying. Obviously, another way to express our politics of buying is through not buying not going to Chick-fil-A because you might identify with gay rights or you know, um, not appreciate the agenda of the people who own Chick-fil-A. Not buying Starbucks because you want Howard Schultz to just stop, maybe. Um, <laughs> but you know, boycotts are a long tradition in, um, they started in Ireland, right? And you know, a long tradition of not buying. But, but I want to just at least sort of raise, just end by raising a question about buying and to think of is buying the same as voting is buying a political act and is not buying in some ways the same as being on a picket line and and um, I want to think about that and, and some people might even argue that buy not buying or acts of consumption are in a sense pre political acts things that in some ways you know get us to act more politically and can organize us in political ways Let's ask you a a follow-up, going back to your first comment about sort of third places, the places we go where we bump up against right. other people. Um, it sounds like, in some ways, you're celebrating the idea of friction, that it's good for democracy for people to, like, actually rub up against people who are different or maybe they even have a problem with and learn how to do it. It strikes me that commerce, increasingly, particularly high-tech commerce, has been about removing friction, enabling you to live your life while ordering everything from your laptop and not having to go out as much as you used to. So there's almost, in the two things you're talking about, there's a, there's a tension like, as consumers, we're trying to remove friction, but for democracy, we should actually welcome it. Yeah, that, I mean, I think it's a really good insight, and, and maybe we can pull them together in the coffee shop itself, right? Um, kind of traditionally in the 19th century and into the 20th century, the coffee shop was that place. It was called the Penny University. And someone would literally read the newspaper, see rates, and then people would start arguing about it. And um, you know, people would talk about that as an important democratic institution because of its ability to, to sort of stage debate. And um, the, the coffee shop I know the most about is Starbucks, which I, I've written a book about. Um, and Starbucks really embraced that idea of conversation when it first opened. Um, but they did something really interesting. There was nobody reading the newspaper allowed at Starbucks. In fact, they made sure that they had tables that were round. And they built those tables. Well, that's why. Okay. They built those tables so people could feel protected and alone in public. And it was very unlikely that someone would sit next to them. You're much more likely, I mean, sociologists watch, look at this all the time. At a rectangular table, you're much more likely to pick mm -hmm. the catty corner table. But very rarely would you join someone at a round table. So in a sense, people went thinking they had this desire for conversation, mm -hmm. but they actually got the right to be alone in public. They were standing up. Yeah. It's, it reminds me, like, with you, what you're saying about beauticians and barbershops, almost the same thing. They were places for conversation. Not too much conversation. It's super cuts, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think also the, the practices that go on in African-American shops are very different, and so they do breathe those kind of conversations. But also to go back to the example of these third spaces and just a reminder that not all consumers are considered equal, right? Ask the two young men who yeah. were, um, you know, had the cops called on them on a Starbucks for do, for meeting in that third space, right? Um, for engage, for doing exactly what Starbucks claims to do, but understanding that... Um, the consequences for different kinds of consumers are different. So even those very sort of benign public spaces about restrooms, right? Segregation laws um, 
prohibited um, African Americans from participating in those spaces with whites. And now that those laws are gone, we still see the vestiges of them in, in these spaces. So, so that's why I think it's always important for us to not think of consumer um, in, in sort of a general sense, because um, the experiences of, of people, of different kinds of consumers, and their engagement both with consumption and also with these spaces differs greatly depending on who we're talking about. Great, thanks. I, I would just add on the, the Starbucks incident, in part, but it's yet another point, right? That incident happened because of the withering of public space, right, of public investment. Philadelphia had hundreds of public bathrooms in 1930. And they closed them in part to stop integration and then to stop all kinds of things. Yeah, and unfortunately, as we're creating a lot of these new public spaces, a lot of those same issues still remain. So I, th I think that's, and that's why I think it's just very important for us to sort of interrogate them. Like I said, keep the marginalized at the center of the conversation. It, it really sort of shifts the whole understanding of how we think about both democracy, but even things like consumption and space and, and all those things that seem to not be racialized, but certainly are. Okay, Paul's leaning forward. I want to give him his chance to join this. So um, I come from a slightly different perspective because I'm a historian of 20th century Germany. So to uh, some degree, the history that I look at is about kind of anxieties about failures of democracy um, and, and to think about how democracy failed and what did people do about that. Um, and for me, what's particularly interesting as we look at this history of 20th century Germany is the ways in which we tend to define it in terms of big events, wars, revolutions, seizures of power, um, attacks, battles. Um, and so then since these are the things that matter, we, can, we, we are concerned about, about catastrophes and violence and, and, and the ways in which they have really horrific impacts on, on huge numbers of people. Um, and if we look at the stories that many people tell about their experiences of the 20th century, um, they tend to focus on their everyday lives, on the fact that they were ordinary people and that they didn't really have any connections to those events that were happening up there, these questions of politics or of, of activism or of, of criminal activity or of crimes against humanity, um, that they were just focused on their lives and their families and their work, and that's what they cared about. And, and, and so for them, talking about everyday life became a way of inoculating themselves from anything to do with this rather dark 20th century German history. Um, but I would suggest that, in fact, that's not the case, and that it's precisely by looking at their everyday <coughs> experiences that we can get uh, a better sense of how ordinary people can participate in extraordinary crimes or extraordinary activities, and that, that the spaces between politics and, and everyday life um, are, in fact, not very far removed, and that, that really what um, focusing on everyday life allows us to do is to think about the ways in which ordinary people um, are both complicit and responsible in their histories, um, and so that's something they should be maybe nervous about because it sort of puts them on the hook for what happens. Um, but I think there's also an element of optimism about that too to suggest that um, they are not just Kind of direct objects of the powers that are shaping their worlds, but in fact are in a position to, to make their own histories. And so in that sense, by acknowledging the ways in which everyday life is not what happens in between the events of history, but in fact is part of the ways in which history happens, um, it's both a challenge and uh, a call to us to think about the ways in which we are makers of our own history, and that is also a responsibility. Now, Paul, we mentioned this when we were talking before, the book on tyranny, which is written by a scholar of the same period as you, makes exactly that point that there were a number of things about Nazi rhetoric and Nazi pra practice, practice that were essentially normalized at the everyday neighborhood level, and that's what helped them take root and um, become so powerful in, in cataclysmic, and he's clearly in his book making some 
analogies to present day, but how did, do you, have you thought about how the extraordinary becomes normalized at the everyday level? Um, so, so I would, I, I'm a little bit cautious about the word normalization, because for me, what I really think about is that um, normalcy is a construct. And so it's not the question that there is a normal, and we tend, if we think about normal, we tend to think, well, normal is peace and sort of not war, and it's about uh, kind of um, raising a family and going to work, and, and that, that things that interrupt normal life are, are kind of, the, the question of the extent to which they can become normalized um, is, I think, approaching it from the wrong direction. Rather, I think, normalcy is itself a kind of construct that we have to decide what becomes normal and what really is remarkable is the ways in which um, people can um, adapt and adjust and make all of their experiences normal um, and that it's precisely the ways in which um, these experiences are um, malleable that, that um, uh, and become integrated into their daily lives um, that um, that extraordinary things become possible. I mean, just one small example. Um, um, under Nazi Germany, that um, the, there was a big campaign to transform the ways in which people greeted each other, right? so that you wouldn't say Guten Tag, you wouldn't say Good Day, but you wouldn't say, said, say Heil Hitler. Right? So this becomes a way in which you try to transform the ways in which daily interactions are, also, are operating. But um, Jews were forbidden legally from using the so-called German greeting from saying Heil Hitler. So if you had a Jewish neighbor or acquaintance and you would saw the, see them on the street, so how would you react? How would you respond? Would you um, sort of make an uh, auspicious uh, statement by saying, going up to them and saying good day, not saying Heil Hitler? Would you um, go up and say Heil Hitler and sort of confront them with their exclusion? Um, or would you, and probably most likely, cross the street so you wouldn't have to meet them, so that you wouldn't put them in an awkward position, um, but also put yourself in an awkward position. So by, by kind of rendering all of these things sort of unawkward, you create a space in which um, the exclusion of your neighbor from everyday life on the street um, is something that you've been participating in. Right, but then the most common interaction of everyday life becomes fraught and completely politicized through that. But I guess the point I would say is that um, what's interesting about looking at that case is that it also underscores the ways in which even outside of the Nazi period, mm -hmm. that still is a political, inter political interaction because it is suggesting about the ways in which how you interact with your neighbor is still um, is still about uh, relationships. And so to somehow suggest, well, it's political when it's about Heil Hitler or saying Guten Tag, but it's not political when it's about um, whether or not I greet my uh, somebody walking down the street in downtown Philadelphia. And I think precisely by looking at these extraordinary regimes or extraordinary situations, it becomes an opportunity for us to think about the ways in which even in our ordinary, normal conditions, those interactions are equally political. Right, and anybody from the South can tell you, we in Philadelphia are really weird about how we don't say hello to anybody on the street in Philadelphia, so. Um, and I, I, Tiffany, thinking about what you said, I'm, you know, in terms of this question of what's normal for the people you're asking us to bring into the center, nor, nor, what's normal was not an experience of peace and freedom of movement and prosperity, it was quite different. <laughs> So. Right, and even just ideas about what civility is, which is often about maintaining the status quo, right? That that is what's civil, that is civil behavior. For those on the sides of power for whom maintaining the status quo is deadly, is harmful, is taking away your right to democracy, right? Then your everyday acts of incivility become, become part of the democratic process, right? That, that really is democratic, right? So, so for, for folks who would go on buses and they, you know, someone like Rosa Parks, someone in her shirt today, like, you know, if, if the civility and upholding law, right? Because we have to remember when we look at the Jim Crow South, we're talking about laws, right? It wasn't just about, it, it covered um, spaces outside of law, but there were laws covering all sorts of everyday behavior. It was all about how to um, constrict everyday behavior. Um, upholding the law 
law, which we think of as something democratic and civil, for African Americans meant enshrining their lack of democratic power. Um, and so we have to even be careful both how we consider normalcy, but civility and engagement um, for those who are on the margins of power. Um, civility is, is not um, something that allows them to exercise democratic power. Okay, I think uh, we'll pause here. Um, there's a lot um, in what you just heard, and we're going to ask you to talk about it a little bit. So again, um, just gather in groups of four or five. That's probably the optimal number. It gives you some different perspectives. But thanks for uh, diving in and participating in the format. It seemed like there was a lot of energy in the room. Let me just go to the panel. Anyone can go first. What did you hear that struck you? What did you notice? Well, I'll start. I guess I went last last time, so I'll jump off here this time. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting was a, a conversation that was eavesdropping on, I guess, uh, um, thinking about, about creating spaces for conversation or for speech uh, and the ways in which also that produces a certain level of anxiety about the extent to which that might get out of control or might be immoderate or that people might, might not have the proper filters to kind of operate. And this was, I think, in a, in a high school context a little bit, um, um, which I thought was really interesting in terms of thinking about this tension between public and free spaces in terms of thinking about what that means and, and how freedom is a little bit anxiety inducing. Mm -hmm. yeah, that kind of dovetails along with um, some of the conversations that I heard about what happens in an era where we're so digitally captured, uh, what happens to these conversations, right? We're talking about how um, you don't really even have space to be bored anymore, right? That if you were standing in line or on a bus or somewhere, and if, before we had our phones, you would sort of stand there awkwardly and often sometimes make eye contact with someone and maybe a conversation might ensue in ways that that doesn't happen now. So there are ways that um, the digital everyday life impedes perhaps democratic conversations, but also thinking about how these digital spaces have opened up new possibilities. Um, we talked about the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too hashtag, as well as the Arab Spring as examples of um, movements, social movements that were launched on social media. So when I think about Black Lives Matter, when Trayvon Martin was murdered, there were no mainstream um, press outlets that were reporting it at all. It took months of um, activists and black journalists tweeting about it, tweeting about it, and, and creating a narrative that actually got attention to it, right? And we think about Me Too and what that did. And so, so there's a way that we have to think about the benefits and the drawbacks of our digital world, both as impeding our access to these conversations, but also giving us unprecedented access to people around the world around which we can build global movements. Um, that actually picks up on a comment that uh, somebody made. The, uh, the format for these written comments was, I think and then I wonder. I think social media should be considered as a key area of political discussion. You know, we, we, I think we all recognize the power. But I wonder how social media will end up playing that role in the future. Uh, I would just throw that I have a, a former colleague and an acquaintance, I wouldn't call it good friend, but um, she did call me when this was happening to her, who got caught. It was in an executive position with a nonprofit and got caught essentially in a tweet storm about uh, an employee of the organization complaining about her. And pretty much within 48 hours, everybody in the world had decided that they had to reject this person so that they could signal you know, their wokeness. Um, and you know the facts will probably never be exactly sorted out, but nobody even waited for the facts to be sorted out. She was basically dead and lost her job, you know, um, within the space of 48 hours because there was that sort of piling on effect of Twitter. So there's this tremendous power, and then there's the the risk that comes with the power. But does anybody want to make bold predictions about how this settles out at some point, whether we end up? Um, being able to corral the negatives enough so that the positives can flourish in social media. Like I told the group, the beautiful thing about being a historian is that we are terrible. <laughs> we don't do, that's not in our pay grade, not right? Um, we'll use the past thing about, but we're terrible prognosticators of the future. But I do think what 
it, I think something will replace social media, right? The way that technologies change, we're talking about the issues of privacy and all the kinds of, you know, the way, uh, just right now there, um, the conversations about um, how should Facebook handle white nationalist groups and hate speech and people who have had their lives threatened on Twitter because of attacks and things like that. I think something will change. What will supplant it? I don't know, but I think the questions will remain. Um, and I think the issue that Face, nothing beats face-to-face -face organizing. I think no matter what comes or where we are now, there are limits to the digital. Um, and I, I do think we're going to probably swing a little bit back to sort of understanding the need for face-to-face -face engagement as a strategy of democracy. But I, I don't, I'm just thinking of that based on the past. I have no sense of what will happen in the future. Well, I like that prediction. Um. I mean, if we learned anything from the last election, mm -hmm. it's that we can't predict anything, right? I mean, both here and in Britain. And so, and, and maybe that's some of the instability that's been created by social media. Um, but I, I do also think that this is a, a moment of where something different is going on. I, I was reading on the train the, this long story in the New York Times Magazine about the Murdoch family. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it made an interesting argument, right, that, that essentially Murdoch and, um, and, and there's been a couple of articles, New Yorker ran an article about this, is they're not what's, in a sense, they're wagging the right-wing dog. They're, they are driving a lot of this story. And, and what I'm kind of amazed about is there's all this possibility for democracy and the kind of dispersion of power at the very moment that power in media is being increasingly concentrated in ways that um, are ominous. And, and, and I do think that it, it does mean something that we have different kinds of understandings of truth at this moment. And, you know, that proliferation would never have happened in the media world that we grew up in of three stations. And so I, I don't know what to do with that, but, 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 but I, I, I do think it, it, it gives and it takes, but there's also something really alarming going on right now that um, is, looks like democracy and, is, and seems threatening at the same time. Maybe one thing that I would add is just, I think we should be cautious about um, presuming somehow that, that democratic forces are inevitably good. Um, um, there's, uh, I, I still wind up teaching this essay, even though it's from 1996, so it's not, not cutting edge in terms of its novel, but it, it asks this question about the interwar democracy in Germany, the Weimar Republic, and it asks, did Weimar fail? Um, and the idea is, well, you know, of course, democracy collapsed and it ended in, in dictatorship, so, well, isn't that an obvious um, answer? And, and this, the, the author's conclusion is rather, well, no, it, it didn't fail. It just achieved one of its admittedly dark possibilities. Um, and that part of the point about the democratic possibilities of social media, I think, is that, that um, it is just another opportunity for democracy to realize a, a dark or a or light possibility. I don't think it's a, and so I think that that's one of the things that's important to, even in our conversation about democracy, um, to think about, about um, you know, well, our goal should not be democracy. Our goal should rather be, in, in some ways, thinking about the, the points that Tiffany brought up at the very beginning about, well, what are these, these freed slaves interested in? They're about interested in a livelihood and safety and a job and food. And, and so rather than thinking about democracy as the end, um, I think one of the things in which we think about everyday life, um, it can help remind us uh, about the importance of, of rendering democracy as a, as a means to some, some other kind of end. Right. It helps to remember, I think the record's pretty clear that those gentlemen who were locked into the brick building on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia did not regard uh, democracy as an unalloyed good when they were writing the Constitution. In fact, part of what they were trying to do was make sure there wasn't too much democracy because their understanding of it was that it could lead to mob rule. On the question of social media as a piece of everyday life and the power of it, does anybody want to from the audience, sort of offer a comment from your discussions or your own thoughts? 
I did hear people talking. Yeah, so <laughs> wait for the mic. We do have a mic. We'll get to you. Hi. Um, our group talked about social media as basically the, the new form of a public space and that we've moved physical spaces to the online realm and that that brings the question of kind of anonymity, that some people are more emboldened to say something because it's instant and maybe there's no repercussion, but others are kind of pushed back from saying th something because maybe there's more repercussion, that it's kind of a duality, it's both. Some people say more and some people say less, both out of fear of a result of that being published in this larger, now much more public space. Yeah, I was at the last gathering that you had also, and I had started thinking about um, social media, and, and there's this uh, book about uh, Huey Long and Father Coughlin, right, Voices of Protest, and Alan Brinkley, his argument is that they were both enormously popular because they were using the social media of their day radio, but they didn't create political movements because everybody could sort of be at home and feel like they were hearing what they wanted to hear and feel like they were part of something, but they, but they weren't organizing into a political party or a, a sort of action group. And I, I wonder if social media does a lot of that, that it's not a substitute after all for going to school board meetings and knocking on doors. Uh, getting people to register to vote, and that, that, you know, that's the real work of democracy, or zoning board hearings and that sort of thing, and and uh, and that sometimes you know you can sort of feel like well you're informed, uh, you know, by watching your favorite cable news or or tweeting or following somebody, but it, it, it there there's a lot of work that's involved in in democratic practice that I think you know might get dulled by that. Right, last time, because we were talking about activism, there was a lot of discussion about the difference between activism and the way you're describing right. and sort of slacktivism, which is just right. sort of notionally saying, well, I'm with that person. Or that. Did you want to jump on that? That sort of seemed to be that. Um, I, want, I wanted to read uh, another comment that came from the audience. Um, and I, I certainly heard a couple of conversations about Chick-fil-A and other things that connect to this. Everything is implicated in politics, even the non-political, and people need to face the facts, is the I think. And then I wonder, this is a great question, I wonder how people can be responsible about, uh, with regard to their everyday life without burning out and reaching a point of saturation. Mm -hmm. That question, that if you're going to be a thoughtful consumer, there is like so much to know and to track and to keep up with in terms of corporate activity and corporate misbehavior. It's like the you know, the, one of the oldest forms of uh, sort of political activism with buying power was buy American. And yeah. then it becomes impossible to figure out what it means to buy American. So I don't know if you want to talk about no. that. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I, I, um, I think you have to take stock of what matters to you. And it's hard to live in a perfect realm, right? I mean, uh, and if I'm thinking about Jason's book, Point, you know, if, if somehow justice is the end of this, right, um, that's an imperfect struggle. And you play your part and you do the things that matter to you. Um, and then maybe you have to go to a school board meeting. I, you know, I think, but, and, but I think you can't, you know, if the, the, the part that gets really messy is someone says, well, you bought chicken today, um, but you know, you're not willing to buy chicken tenders or, you know, right? I mean, the distinctions can be, and, and the distinctions can be really fine-grained, right? You know, I'm in favor of fair trade, but not um, rainforest coffee. And, 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 but that's to trivialize the matter, right? And part of it is you are thinking about what matters to you, what you think is the right thing to do. And I think where it becomes political is, is when you talk about it. Right, you, you, you make that decision purposeful and you engage people in conversations about why you're not going to Chick-fil-A, why it matters to you and why that act that might be, seem like a pebble in, in, in water means something more than that. And, and, and I think that's part of the difference, right, of turning that kind of every day into part of your broader political conversation. And another thing that mixes up even more is people sometimes will conflate or 
at the same time talk about things they're doing to signal their class or their status. Yeah, oh, <laughs> I mean, as opposed to actual moral imperatives, they'll treat things that just signal that they have better taste and treat it as a moral imperative. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Much buying is about performing a certain identity. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tiffany. Right, or, or even how class impacts your ability to in, to make the choices, right? Like a lot of um, the issue around politics, particularly around the politics of, of every day, has to do with choices, right? So when there are folks who rightly critique or, um, companies like Walmart, for example, but to do that without thinking about um, for many poor people, that is one of the few spaces where they can actually purchase food or purchase items for their families, right? It, and so, so we have to even think about within our own sphere of life, what are the range of choices and possibilities we have? Um, and also, I think, be a bit forgiving about um, thinking about the kind of limitations that other people have to engage with it, right? So it's always a question of, of, of power. And that's why I think the movement, uh, the conversation away from the term democracy to justice, I think, is really where it is because that, that issue of power and power dynamics and, and who even has certain kinds of choices to make. For example, the example of the school board meeting, which is a a great one. Um, if there are people who are very, who the consequences of what happens in that school board meeting are working two jobs and don't have the kind of paid leave that someone else has, that means that the people who show up to the school board meeting have a disproportionate amount of power, but that also means that these are probably people who have more leisure time and access anyway, right? And so I think it's messy. <laughs> I mean, I think that's really the, the short answer of it, that the project of democracy or justice is messy and I think the problem and one of the groups was talking about how we even think about history and how that impacts this conversation we, we can't think of it as like a zero sum win and loss game because I think that when we do that it becomes a check off like okay well you know racism ended in the civil rights movement check now we can move on to something else instead of understanding these contestations that these are ongoing struggles that the struggle continues that the struggles change that that we have to be ever vigilant, right? There's no point at which we can rest from this. If we sort of prepare ourselves for the long journey of it, then I think these questions about it being so much, we're, we're looking at it in a, from a much longer point of view versus the very kind of American meta narrative of like, okay, we fixed and solved that, let's move on to something else. The myth of eternal progress. Right. <laughs> um, I also think this idea of, of Acknowledging and taking seriously the humanity of other people even um, is is really important, and I think part that's one of the real benefits I think of adopting this kind of everyday life approach because it helps us to recognize the ways in which there are very small scale local human costs to these things that we can concern, are concerned ourselves about. Um, in terms of kind of dynamics within households, who gets food, who doesn't, um, and and that that to really pay attention to the ways in which power operates, not just at on, on big scales, whether we're talking about state governments or police or armies, um, but also in terms of of um, fathers and children and. Um, um, and, and even in terms of thinking about the ways in which they experience the apartments they live in or the household, whether or not it's warm or cold or um, whether or not um, it's clean, whether or not there's a toilet in the apartment or they have to go up the stairs. Um, um, and that these kinds of, of ways in which physically, bodily, they experience the reality of these power relationships um, by paying attention to these human implications. I think it also becomes a way in which we uh, can avoid being too sure of our absolute solutions or that we've, we have checked off the, the box. Again, any reactions to that or we sort of kicked off that really interesting discussion with the question of consumer choices and how you sort of personally navigate consumer choices. Was there anything that came up in the discussions? Well, and the, and the illusion of choice. Right. And the illusion of choice. Um, anything that came up in the discussions anybody out there wants to share? You're going to make them do all the work, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wait, wait for the microphone. Yeah. There's a, a book out. You may have read it. Fruits of Conversation. Are you familiar with it? Written by about four or five uh, psychologists 
who took to task to say, what, what is a crucial conversation? And the last remarks from um, about looking at the humanity of each other, seeing, seeing the Jesus in each of us, or whatever the Jesus you believe in, the Buddha, or whatever, to see it in the person that you're dealing with, with whom you're dealing, um, is really the, the seed that begins uh, the ability to have those crucial conversations. Crucial conversations being high risk for either or both parties, that kind of stuff. It's a worthwhile read. I would, I would if you had a chance to uh, get to it, what we see uh, with a lot of our uh, institutions is if we, to get a good solution, to get a good strategy, you need a great conversation and you need great ideas. When you don't have a relationship that is based in that, uh, not just respect, but love and respect, you will fail to find out all of the good opportunities that are sit in front because you stop listening, because you're, you, you're, you don't insult somebody to your opinion, you know, that kind of idea. Uh, you, you've got to bring them in to your heart and to, to, to understand, listen to understand, not necessarily to respond. And that's what we've done. Your last remark, sir, hit right on, the, right on the nail what that's about. Not to know, and I think you, you started it earlier as the commentator saying, when you hear that thing, don't get violent, but don't get silent. You know, take a deep breath, think about it, try to understand. And I think that's the key to that messiness we call democracy. It's going to be messy, but it's up to us to, to, to deal with each other on that one-to-one -one basis in order to live with the mess, because it's a divine mess. It's okay. We've done all right. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another observation um, from the audience that so it connects with what we're, we've been talking about in an interesting way. It's, I think that culture moves faster and can bring a stronger emotional slash moral imperative than law. And I wonder if culture is more powerful than law in shaping the status quo. Sort of, sort of suggesting that the culture that we inhabit in everyday life is actually more powerful than the laws that the political process. Produces. I think that if by culture, I mean, culture drives law, and, and I think we have to understand the relationship between the two. Law isn't this sort of um, perfected thing. It is, is socially constructed. It is culturally constructed, and laws often reflect our culture, particularly around issues of power again, right? That, and, and this is why I think having these conversations or engaging in this work is so difficult is that because it costs those with power something, right? That there's a reason why laws are created the way they are to enshrine political power. And so laws are never these perfect things. They, they follow the dictates of culture and society, um, which is why it costs us something if we want to talk about democratic change. And why, and I tell this to my students all the time, there is not one movement, major movement, that has expanded democracy or justice in this country that has come without bloodshed. We don't like to hear that, right? We think about, oh, the American Revolution, that was a war. Like, every act of expanding democracy or justice in any way, it has never been passive. It has never been without people literally putting bodies on the line. And so it shows you how high the stakes are. And the reason why is to disrupt law, to disrupt order, is going to cost people in power something, and power concedes nothing about a fight, as Frederick Douglass said. So, so I think if we sort of change, we have to undo our myths about, like we're saying, about American progress and about law um, as if it is this sacrosanct thing instead of understanding it is constructed to preserve measures of power, and if there are areas we want it to change or if we want democratic ideals to expand or, or the, the possibilities of justice to expand, it puts, people put People die over this. Like this is not. That's what I'm saying. Like this is this is not this is not a game um, in that regard. And so I think framing it in that way and understanding what's at stake sort of causes us to think differently about these questions. I would say. I mean, culture. Be, it's it's a really interesting and slippery place, right? And, and and even the term is slippery. But but I think of that kind of amazing scene if you've seen it from Do the Right Thing. Um, the Spike Lee movie about the riot in in Brooklyn, and you know it sort of features this relationship between the Spike Lee character and these two Italian guys who run this pizza parlor, 
who openly sort of practice and participate in racism, yet their wall is filled with people, African American sports and entertainment figures. And when confronted about it, they say, well, they're not black. Like they have, have found this way to kind of make this distinction that, that I think sometimes culture allows things in without a lot of thought and a lot of commitment. And yet, culture can be the very realm of the fight, right? It, 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 its slipperiness makes it hard to pin down and analyze. Um, and, and the way, and, and then I think that the other point about the way we reify the law, right, as if it's not slippery, it, it adds to that story, right? Um, in favor of the study of history, any study of the history of the United States Supreme Court <laughs> will show that there are almost no eternal principles held up by the court. They are basically um, following whatever parade the society decides needs to be in front at that point. Uh, another thought from the audience, um, and I'm interested with the, the second word in this sentence. Our generations today have become so polarized in the way we think and act. Okay, that's not not talking about party, it's talking about generations being polarized. Um, I don't know if that came up in any discussions out there, but that's, I haven't thought of it that way. I think of the, go ahead, Paul, did you have? Um, I mean, it's interesting to think about generations and the ways in which generations can be transformative. And I, so I don't know in kind of this polarization of generations, polarization within generations that somehow, uh, or if it's about one generation being set against another. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's, it's interesting, um, I mean, so in the, to take the German case, the, the one generation that still kind of continues to generate both a lot of anxiety and a lot of interest is the, the, the generation of 1968, right? so the kind of the student movement of 1968 and the ways in which they, on the one hand, were repudiating their parents of the Nazi era and that are kind of opening up a new um, style of politics, a new form, and that this is kind of a possibility. Um, but on the other hand, there's a sense that that um, um, th they wound up buying into all the systems that, or at least a large number of them, buying in their comfortable bourgeois by the by the end of the um, and moving into the, the 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 sections of power. And so, part of this is a question about this this ebb and flow of generations. It might be to say um, that. That there's this passage of time that that about is maybe larger about access to power, and once people get into power, that kind of the 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 radicals, the revolutionaries, maybe don't look quite so radical and revolutionary anymore. I, I'm not sure that that's let, a very let me, decisive answer. Let but, me let me put this to the students here, if you're willing to respond. I, I wonder if this is part of what's going in this observation. How many of you feel that? my generation, the, the two generations represented up here at the front of the room, have basically screwed things up so badly that your life is inevitably going to be diminished and more cramped and have less opportunity than we enjoyed, thanks to the greatest generation giving us a good world, um, at least for some of us. I mean, how many of you really feel like we have screwed it up for you? I know my kids feel that, but uh, <laughs> anybody want to try that one? Just financially, environmentally, climatologically. We'll, we'll close our eyes. Yeah. <laughs> really, you're not being graded on your answer. No one want to take that one? Okay. I just thought I'd give it a try. Maybe that you all could do it better. Maybe that's easier. Maybe they don't want to condemn <laughs> older a, folks. A great positive that way. That when you all get into a place of power, you all will be able to do this better. Y'all feel that? Can you retrieve the question? Which one? The one about the appeal of the screwed it up. Rephrase oh. it to the point. Well, that was the question I wanted to ask. What question do you want to ask? It's the same one, but it's saying, how, how often are you told that we screwed it up? And who's telling you that we did? Because I think you're being sold. <laughs> like when we were sold. Yeah, I'm a Kennedy kid. Irish Catholic. Um, we understood the first Irish Catholic president. Camelot came along. Camelot was a farce. It was not real. It was not a real thing. But they built it in order to get elections. Right? And we use this narrative that 
Yeah, we're going to, we screwed it up, so we're sorry, we're, we're through it, the earth has done this. But I get the impression that it's just people wanting to be president, people wanting to be senator, telling us the bill of goods, say, hey, vote for me, I'll change it. And I don't know if we're getting real data, I don't know if we're getting real knowledge. I don't think any of the teachers up there would take a term paper if I did a footnote from Wikipedia. Right? And I think that's what we get. Fill out Wikipedia. We, we, we don't, we have to sit here and go through a lot of different, what they call facts, narratives, that we have to figure out on our own what's real, what's done. That's, that's frustrating for us. Okay, we have a response over here and then down here. All, all the old people want to grab this question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Older, sorry. Old, old, older. Yeah, older. older. I was going to say, I, I do think there is this sort of, talking about generations is one of the few forms of prejudice that's still allowed publicly. I mean, it's this massive generalization. I mean, I, you know, I'm in the baby boom generation. I'm in that sort of the pig in the python, you know, mm -hmm. demographically. And, I mean, you know, to, to generalize about 67 million people is just crazy. And, um, or to talk about millennials as if there's some sort of coherent group out there um, who might have experienced some of the same social influences. But, they're, you know, they're as much individuals as, as anybody else. But we have, you know, you mentioned the greatest generation. And, and so somehow... Baby boom just didn't live up to, you know, whatever it is they were supposed to have done. I, I mean, it's all. It seems to me, a, a sort of. A but would you agree there? There are broad statistical facts about consumption, debt, um, environmental damage that are true and can be attributed. Yeah, but I don't. I don't know that that is necessarily. I mean, I don't feel responsible for much of that. To be honest right. with you. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. I mean, you know. But. All right. So I want. I want to go back there. To this. Uh, I find it to be the exact opposite. I think that. Yeah. Wait, wait for the mic, if you would. Yeah, thanks. I think that regardless of the generation or who it was, um, in the same time, I think that they would find themselves, ask themselves the same question, because. The things that you're talking about, debt and damage to the economy, it's regardless, some way or another it would alter. And I think that past generations have had so much experience and they've been at the forefront of many civil movements or movements in general and they've been a part of that and that just kind of paved the way for the future and it's always going to change and whether it's for better or for worse, you don't know until you go through it. I would say, but um, I wouldn't say that there was an overall negative impact on past generations. Okay, I'll accept your exoneration. <laughs> Thank you. uh, we're, we're just about to wrap up. I think we had a comment down there. We're okay. Any, any other last burning observations from... Uh... Should I wait for the... Yeah, yeah, because it'll be hard for people in back to hear. I'd like to go back for a moment to the comment that you were making, um, having read the Times piece about the Murdochs. We talk in our, we, we're talking here this evening about um, the, the micro aspect of democracy, the person to person, the what we'll consider the ordinary citizen dealing with other ordinary citizens. And then you have the outsized, in my opinion, pernicious effect of the Murdoch Empire. I read, this, I read the same piece and had actually worked for the Murdoch Empire for a number of years. Um, how, I wonder how much counter effect ordinary citizens can have against the outsized influence of the money, um, of the money that the Murdochs bring to bear. I mean, the Murdochs, as you saw, as you, anyone who read that article knows, control 60% of the newspaper distribution in Australia. They've changed the politics of Australia. They put, they changed the politics of, of Great Britain. It was the Murdoch organization that was behind the, uh, behind the, uh, the Brexit movement. It's the Murdoch organization that has outsized, in an outsized way, influenced the political discussion here in the United States and have placed politicians in positions of power. 
my concern, my worry is, from a democratic point of view, how do ordinary citizens counteract that kind of outsized influence of one individual's, you know, one individual's mind? And it's turning out that his son is even more um, to the right than, than right, he right. is. And I, I'm sorry, I don't necessarily want to get into right and left, but right. it's, it's, it's hard to avoid. So my concern, um, and I would be interested in other comments, is how how do we how do we work against that outsized influence of money, money, and money? I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that other than, but but I think Tiffany brought it up earlier. I, I mean, social movements, and they're social movements. They're not. I, I don't know. I still believe in social <laughs> movements of people sort of organizing with their bodies in space to challenge power and authority. And there is, you know, the study of American history is to study the kind of woeful accumulation of power and the moments when people have broken through to break those barriers of power. And, and, and again, those don't end neatly ever, but I think to lose faith in that is to lose faith in, in the democratic project, right? I mean, part of what we were talking about is how do you get to that moment where people will come together to recognize their collective interest together to challenge authority? And, you know, maybe there is a faith in that project's possibility. And I think the other faith is, is to a certain extent in the power of both historians and journalists to tell those stories, to reveal, um, the kind of pernicious power. Um, Nancy McLean published a book last year, a really powerful book about the Koch brothers and their, you know, the influence and power they've had on universities and the creation of knowledge itself. But that's part of a project of reclamation, right, to tear it down. Um, that journalist, you know, they saw that article as that point, right, to challenge it. And I, and I think, you know, possibly they can work together. It's It's... The, the telling of those stories <coughs> along with people seeing their interests together in new kind of collectives, right? And that, that we don't know what those new collectives look like, but I think for me, I have some faith that, they'll, that they will possibly develop. If I could jump out of moderator role and, and answer your question like, you know, sort of exhausted by fighting journalistic battles. I mean, what I now do is work on engagement in civic dialogue. <coughs> So at the level of everyday life, one thing you could think about doing is when you hear people who are living in a different information bubble from your own, first thing is to recognize you're probably living in your own bubble and to interrogate your own bubble. But the second thing is to, you know, and this is really, really hard, and it's even harder on the sort of personal level, the neighborhood walking around the neighborhood level that you guys were talking about before. But not to just sort of roll your eyes and say, oh, well, I'm not going to engage with that person, but actually engage with them not by responding with position, but by responding with question. You know, well-informed question and just really try to get them to discover the pebble in their shoe as you try to discover the pebble in your own. Uh, and you just do it over and over again. Again, it's not, you know, they're not going to be aha moments where people go, oh, you're right, I'm absolutely, I've been in the Fox News bubble and you've, it's not going to happen. It'll be just inserting little bits of doubt or little bits of fact or just asking the right question and asking people to ponder things in a new way. And it, it's real slow patient work and it's not comfortable. I mean, you know, it's not hanging out in the neighborhood like most people, most people are not going to thank you for doing that. But it is one thing at the level of everyday life that you can do. Uh, and it's not saying I'm not going to let things pass unchallenged. I'm just not going to let things pass undiscussed. I'm going to say, well, here's kind of how I look at it. Or I read this and it said that. I mean, what do you think about that? It's not, you know, always, uh, you know, at the neighborhood level, neighborly level, it's not always getting on your soapbox and it's not always thrusting your fist in the air. Not that there isn't, there aren't moments and times for doing that. So that would be my suggestion at the level of everyday life, what you can do. And it's a skill. I mean, it's a skill that has to be learned in practice. It doesn't come naturally. I'm not even good at it, and I preach it. <laughs> so I think uh, we're getting the sign that we've exhausted ourselves with all this civic engagement dialogue. I want to thank Tiffany Gill, Paul Stieg, and um, my goodness, I'm forgetting your last name. Brian Simon. Thank you.
Let's thank them all for their contributions.